as always, there's a lot going on. The building is really progressing nicely. There's a lot of activity and the graduations that are going on. We have a baccalaureate this morning. And speaking of going on, we're starting a brand new sermon series entitled Witness Today. Now, for some of you, when you hear the word witness, it energizes, you get really excited. For other of us, it might create a little bit of anxiety. We know we're called to witness, but what does that really mean? What is God really calling us to do? Well, that sermon series, Pastor Randy is gonna lead us into the word to discover more about that. We really encourage you, hope you enjoy our blessed today, but hope you stay with us on this three-part series starting today, next week, and the following week. Vespers this evening is a very special. It is on the Holy Land trip that some of us were able to go on. If you have not been, please put it on your bucket list. It is a delightful, wonderful trip. But if you are not able to go anytime soon, come to Vespers this evening at five o'clock. You will be able to see a video that the media team put together. Also, Dr. Randy Roberts will be here, Dr. Garrity and Dr. Bramlett. They will be here. Dr. Bramlett and Dr. Garrity are archeologists that went on the trip. So come out and join us at five o'clock this evening. Now, next week we have our annual memorial service and here's Pastor Adrian to tell us more about it. Our annual memorial service will be on Sabbath, June 8th for both services. This is a time when we honor the lives of our loved ones who went to sleep in Jesus during the past year. Our theme this year is cherishing family and friends whose love remains in our hearts. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It is through each of us that the fulfillment of this scripture is realized as we reach out and love on our grieving and bereaved members. We invite our entire church family to join us on that day as we show love and support to our brothers and sisters who have lost loved ones. Following each of the services, there will be a light reception in the patio area just to my right. I, along with our visitation pastors and bereavement team, look forward to meeting family members and friends for a few moments of personal interaction, fellowship, and encouragement. Our children's ministry puts on a wonderful Vacation Bible School. It begins June the 9th. Many of you have already registered. If you have not yet registered your children though, please do it ASAP. All of the groups are filling up and if you wait too long, there may not be an opportunity for you to send your children anymore. So go online, there is the registration form there and sign your children up so they can enjoy a wonderful beginning of their summer. There are so many things going on in this church. There's so many opportunities for volunteering. Today we wanna to highlight something that's very dear to my heart and that's the media ministry. We're always needing volunteers. We particularly urgently need some volunteers now. Don't have to worry if you haven't had any experience, we're happy to train you. If you are interested, go to our website, lluc.org, click on the volunteer and follow the prompts there and let us know you're interested. We'd love to talk to you. Many of you have noticed that we no longer have a crosswalk from parking structure one to the church. The city has taken that away temporarily. I know this has caused a great inconvenience, trust us, we know this, but we encourage you, please use the designated crosswalks for your own safety. Then just a quick reminder, there's no Sabbath school this morning due to the baccalaureate from Loma Linda Academy. And then on the 15th, there won't be any Sabbath school here in the sanctuary. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, check out the website, the app, or of course, we always love to see you at the Uconnect Center in the foyer. We love you guys and we're so glad that you're worshiping with us. On behalf of everyone behind the scenes and the pastoral staff, have a terrific Sabbath. A blessed Sabbath and happy welcome to all of you who have come to worship here today. And that means you too, choir. So glad to have you here. You know, this is the best place I know of to be on a Sabbath morning. Every day that is the end of the week is better because it's the Sabbath and we get to come together in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're fed. I was here for first service. I was fed. You're going to be fed as we hear Pastor Randy begin the new series. And I want to welcome all of you who are out there in your front seats joining us for the service. 
blessings to you as well. And Pastor Randy, we've got special people around here, and you're going to tell us about one of us anyway. Thank you very much, Pastor Dan. I appreciate that. Being joined on the platform here this morning by somebody that is no stranger to our congregation. You know him well. This is Gary Deliberto. Gary is a security officer here at Loma Linda University Health and has been for some years, but he has also filled another extremely important role, and that is that Gary has been one of our best greeters. Actually, he's been on security here at Loma Linda University Church. We've been very thankful for that. He's been very helpful on many occasions. But you know him because in the process of being a security officer here, LLUH security officer, he's also become a part of our community in a significant way. He's not a member of our church, but he's become one of the best greeters we have. There are others who do a great job as well, but I don't know that anybody does a better job than Gary. And Gary, we're so deeply grateful and thankful for that. Yes, absolutely. Now, I'm saddened to tell you that Gary is retiring and moving across the country to Georgia. I'm really saddened to tell you that. In fact, two weeks from today will be his last Sabbath with us. And Gary, we all are going to feel your loss deeply, but I want to ask you just a little bit. You've contributed greatly to us. Tell us what you will take from LLUC with you to Georgia. Thank you. Uh, you know, I grew up Presbyterian, not by choice, that's what my mom and dad said. <laughs> but as I grew up, you did your one hour a week on Sunday, and then you checked the box, and you were good to go. You got six days off. But here, you know, you're Seventh-day Adventist, and I think you should call yourself Seven Days a Week Adventist, because <laughs> you commit to this church, you have pride in this church, I see it every day, you have other activities throughout the week, and everybody just is happy to be here, and I, wow. I was happy to go to church too, but we just, it wasn't, I didn't seem, and maybe I was too young to understand the full commitment my parents did on other days of the week or whatever, but... Here, I see it all the time. I'm here, like vacation Bible school, so many parents are involved and helpers. That I just see a seven-day commitment. I, that's what I'm gonna take with, is that everybody is fully committed. They're, they have pride in this church. And when I come back to visit, I'll be glad to be here. Oh, I, that's wonderful, yeah. Gary. Well, I'll have to tell you one, thank you. I'll have to tell you that one of the things that makes Sabbath morning a happy Sabbath is you walk onto the campus and there's Gary saying to you, happy Sabbath, and drawing you into worship. Now, you are going to Georgia. Georgia. What are you going to be doing in Georgia? Well, uh, I was there before. We have a house. We're moving back into our house. Uh, some alligator hunting, legally, of course. Uh, my friend works for now, the... Wait, wait, wait. Alligator hunting. Now, I want a show of hands. How many of you have ever gone alligator hunting? I don't well, see a single. Come out to Georgia. <laughs> yeah, I, I promise you'll come home with both your arms and legs. Uh, we caught a 14-footer one time, brought him home alive. Mercy! And, uh, wow. But they're they're nuisance alligators that people complain about. They call DNR, and we go hunt them and take care of them to help out. Well, we're going to be praying for you that you survive <laughs> these these expeditions, Gary. We want you to know this is for you. We thank you so much. We wish you God's grace and His blessings. We look forward when you come back to visit and hope you'll make us a stop on your trip. Yeah. Yes, yes, it, please. I, we go on a lot of cruises. We've been very fortunate, my wife and I. And at the end of a cruise, people are sad because they got to go home, they got to catch a flight, go back to work. I tell people, don't be sad it's over. Be glad it happened. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm taking with me. I, it's, it is over. I am sad, but I'm also glad that it happened. I'm glad I got to meet every one of you. I should be back for the graduations next year uh, and uh, Vacation Bible School, uh, hopefully it falls in that group. There. All right, Gary. God bless you. Thank you so much. All the best. Love you, Gary. And from afar or near, you're still a part of this family, Gary, and we do appreciate you. I pray that you will accept and be blessed with the words of our Savior.
Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Gracious God, we come into your presence, praising your name for your creative power, for all creation, your mighty works in it, the majestic mountains, the vast universe, and the powerful ocean. But most of all, we're thankful that you created each one of us and that you have sent your son to be our redeemer. And that's the second thing we thank you for is your redemption. And Lord, we know that because Jesus shed his blood, we are reconciled with you. And we are grateful for that. And there are many people in our congregation who have special needs this morning. And we pray that you will be with them. You know what they are, those who are sick, those who are suffering, those who are grieving. And we, we don't need to tell you because you know and you care. 
and we just pray that you will be with each one and grant what they need. And as Pastor Randy begins his new series, Witness, we pray that we may grow closer to Jesus and that we will have something to share, to bear testimony to his goodness and the change in our life as we are following you and growing as disciples. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so thrilled to be joined on the platform today with Kimberly and Justin, the proud parents of Lorenzo, and I'm excited for this day. Not just for Lorenzo, but Kimberly and Justin, you have been part of the Bible Lab community for about two and a half years now and are part of our leadership team. We could not do the Bible Lab without you, and so it's so great to be here on this very special occasion with Lorenzo, who we've got to see born during the process of being part of a community. Today, I'm excited to be able to dedicate Lorenzo into God's service. And as we just pause and take a moment, there's several things. The name Lorenzo, I tried looking it up to see what it means. And uh, you may disagree with me, but uh, Uncle Google told me that Lorenzo actually comes from the old Latin word used both in Italian and Spanish uh, for Laurentius, which means someone from Laurentum. Now you know. And if we stop there, we totally miss something really, really beautiful because Laurentum, if you look at what, where did that town get its name from? Uh, Laurentum actually comes from Loris, which means the laurel crown that you wear signifying wisdom and accomplishment. And so, Lorenzo, your name means wisdom and accomplishment, much like a laurel reef in your parents' in your parents' head. That's right. You don't look like you, you agree with me there. But it's true. The whole reason why we're here is we're praying for God's wisdom and that God will accomplish His will through you for the kingdom of God. And so today it's my, yeah, I agree. It's my privilege, Lorenzo. You've got such great names, Lorenzo, Anthony, Ragone. No one's going to beat you up, Tony. No. So Lorenzo, today I am going to pray for God's wisdom. Obviously, he's given you understanding and his accomplishment. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for Lorenzo. He has changed Kimberly and Justin's lives. We pray that from this day forward, you will grant him your wisdom and that you will accomplish much so that you will change many lives to help them understand your love and your character through the life and living testimony of Lorenzo. And so today, we dedicate him into your service, praying that your Holy Spirit will take charge and guide him into the way he should go. In Luke 2.52, Lord, you said that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature in favor with God and man. And that's what we pray for Lorenzo today. And we pray in your precious name of Jesus. Amen.
As the deacons wait upon us, I invite you to join us in singing Go Tell It on the Mountain with a little bit of a new twist. So, yeah. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is come. Live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of kings. Be thou the glorious answer to all my questionings. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is come, and bless the world go hungry while we ourselves are fed. Make each of us more ready to share our daily bread. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. He gave us eyes to see him and lips that we might tell how great is God Almighty who has made all things well. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is come. All right, kiddos, it's time for the Lamb's Offering. Why don't you come on down, gathering as you come? I know that Pastor Philip has a great story to tell you, so come on down here to the front, and we're all going to sing a good oldie, Give Me Oil in My Lamp, as you're all coming down. Well, today we're going to do something together. We may get a little bit tired, but can I have you do something first? I want you all to line up right here in front of me. Stand up, and we need to do a few stretches. Stretches. You know why? Stretch your legs out a little bit. Because we are going to do jogging with Jesus today. Yep. You see, Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 says that I run the race so that I might win the prize. And he said he never runs a race so he doesn't win. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we run a race in order to win? I'll tell you, it starts with keeping your eyes on Jesus. 
So we're going to learn three things not to do while we're trying to win the race of life, okay? So all of you boys and girls, everyone kind of line up over here right in this middle aisle. Try and line up over here and get into the middle aisle. I want you all to be looking at me for this. You have to really pay attention. So here we go. Are you ready? So first thing, we're going to just try basic running, all right? You're going to run in place because we don't run in church, right? <laughs> right. Okay, so you don't have to be single file line. That's okay. You can be right here. So we're just going to run in place like this, okay? I, I'm not seeing everyone going. Come on. You were chasing your mom and dad's out of the house earlier. There we go. Okay, so now you can stop. I can see all of you know how to run. But now, what if I told you run with your eyes closed? Oh, that's easy. Easy? Okay, stop. You seem pretty good at that. But now, if you're going to win a race, you think you could run the whole race with your eyes closed? No, you don't know the truth and truth. I saw some of you nodding your head. You could. You want to try running right from here to here with your eyes closed? Okay, you come right here. Okay, you start right here. Start right here. Turn this way. Okay, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now run to this side. Whoa, pretty good, pretty good. But now could you run the whole race that way? I don't know. Now the other thing you shouldn't do when you're trying to win the race of life, you shouldn't try and look backwards while you're running the race. I'm not looking at the choir, nothing against you guys, but I want all of you to now run in place looking backwards. Run forward but look backwards without falling over. Whoa, okay, that's it, stop. There was some excitement on that one. Now, the other thing is, you shouldn't run the race of life looking sideways the whole time. If you kept looking sideways while you're running this way, whoa, you'll fall over. You see, sometimes we forget when we run the race of life, we don't have to be afraid of what's in front of us with our eyes closed. Oh God, I don't know what I'm about to get into. Because if your eyes are on Jesus, you can be excited for what's to come. And you don't have to be afraid of the things, the bad things you might have done in your past. Maybe you hit your brother or sister. Maybe you took something you shouldn't have. You don't have to be afraid of the things behind you because what's in front of you is Jesus. And he already won the race by dying on the cross. But the other thing is, you don't want to get distracted by the things on the left or the right. Like that really nice cake or, or Satan. Yeah, that's a good one. Don't get distracted by Satan. So boys and girls, I want you to remember as you go to your seats today, keep your eyes on Jesus. Because when your mom and dad tell you that story about Jesus before you go to bed, that's not just a story to feel nice to go to bed. It's about a story that will save your life. All right, love you guys. Jog gently without running at all to your moms and dads. If you thought that was just a story for the children, I want you to remember, this is about the kingdom in your life as well. Don't get tied up on the things in your past or the distractions on the side. Keep your eyes on Jesus. I am joined on the platform with some very special people. These are our directors for Pathfinders of Loma Linda University Church. Very dedicated ministers right up here. However, we have the outgoing director and the incoming, so I'm gonna spend a little time over here. This is Dr. Diana Villanueva. She and her husband, Gideon, have been directors for how many years? Um, we've been directors uh, in Pathfinder for two amazing years, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank my leadership team, my staff, counselors, and all the Pathfinders for the great time we had. We really enjoyed Pathfinders. We enjoyed the camping, the going to the beaches, the nature study, and most of all, 
to see in the eyes of young people how they grow in love and in grace with Christ. And uh, I am so thankful for the opportunity also given by Loma Linda University Church for giving us a chance to be your Pathfinder directors together with my husband. Amen. I would like you to help me applaud and to thank her and her family for being directors. The influence of the Pathfinder ministry is amazing. And I understand that Gideon, her husband, and her two children are already in the Philippines, and she will join them shortly. Now, we're very excited about two gentlemen of this church who have chosen to step into leadership. This is Lauren Smith and Andy Nadella. And they have decided to join together and be co-directors. And this makes uh, the church very, very happy. Uh, let's start with you, um, Andy. How long have you been in Pathfinder organization? I've been in Pathfinder organization for the last two years now. Wow. And how about yourself, Lauren? I've been in Pathfinders for six years now. That's fantastic. Why do you, uh, why do you like this ministry so much, Andy? Hey, I love the ministry because, first of all, I grew up in this ministry, uh, being a member of this church many years ago as a child. And um, the other reason why I like the ministry is that as Seventh-day Adventist, uh, there's a very strong, rich history and traditions on Pathfinders. And not only that, but Pathfinders has been a blessing to me. And uh, I'm certain that as we are here as an audience, uh, there have been many who have been blessed by this Pathfinder ministry, or at least know of others, too, who have been a part of this ministry, too, as well. And most importantly, how it's... Uh, help me and many others in growing in their relationship. It gives many young people an opportunity to grow in their relationship with Christ. I want to second that. Uh, it's been a privilege and an honor to, to be with Pathfinders through these years and, and watch them uh, grow closer to Christ in that process. Also, uh, this is the year for Oshkosh, and it happens every five years. That's the International Pathfinder Campery. It happens in Wisconsin. And uh, Pastor Mace, I want you to picture this. August in Wisconsin, it's hot, it's humid, and you're surrounded by 50,000 sweaty pathfinders, <laughs> some of which have questionable bathing habits. <laughs> but it's a character building experience. And praise the Lord for his many deliverances. So Oshkosh is gonna keep the pathfinders busy. We're looking forward to going. There's gonna be many activities there. Uh, it's an international campery, so we get to hang out with Pathfinder clubs from not only our conference in North America, but, but all over Africa, Asia, and, and other places. And uh, in terms of the activities and honors we're going to do, just to give you an idea, I'll name a few. Uh, we're going to do the dog honor. Well, if we choose to. It's available. The cat honor. Journey through creation. Kites. Cactus. Unicycle. There's, there's a skill we all need. African lore, origami, Lego design, canoe building, hatchet and knife throwing wow. with appropriate adult supervision. <laughs> and we do have insurance. Yeah. Okay. So many activities, both on site and off site. But the highlight of every day, uh, I got to go to the last camper in 2014. The highlight for us was at the end of every day, we all gather. All 50,000 of us will be gathering at a place to worship in front of a big stage every evening. And uh, we'll sing together, pray together. And uh, this year's theme is uh, Chosen. So we'll be studying the story of David. Yes. So after Oshkosh, we look forward to next Pathfinder season. Yes. So the next Pathfinder season is about to begin two months from uh, this month. In August, we are going to be hosting an open enrollment. Uh, it will be listed on our website. And then at that time, we will invite all church family uh, with uh, children, Pathfinder ages, to enroll them at the church website. And more details will be forthcoming. Thank you for your support.
Our new sermon series, Witness, is three parts, and today we begin the very first one. But before we hear Pastor Randy's message, Tell Your Story, please join me in reading the following quotes. Sometimes God redeems your story by surrounding you with people who need to hear your past so that it doesn't become their future. Your story is the key that can unlock someone else's prison. God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Live in such a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to know God because they know you. Something to think about as we return to the service, our prayer for you is that you will be encouraged to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Our scripture reading today is found in the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 8 and verses 18 through 20 in today's New International Version. You will find this in your pew Bible on pages 1495 and 1496. The scene begins with Jesus and his followers. Please follow along as I read verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want from me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then, a little later, in verse 18, As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. May God bless the reading of his word. As Christ followers, we find ourselves at an awkward place in the context of our culture. That could be said of a variety of different realities, but today I'm thinking of one specifically. We are caught between the fact that on the one hand, Jesus told us as his disciples to go tell the world, to share with the world the news that we have been given. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have a world and a society and a culture that has become increasingly resistant to any such realities. I began to notice that in a particular way somewhere between 25 and 30 years ago. In fact, I can remember not quite, but almost three decades ago, a conversation I had out here outside of our church between here and the hospital on the sidewalk with Clarence Schilt, who was one of the associate pastors of this congregation at that time. Our conversation surrounded the fact that there was an increasing sense within the culture around us, a growing stream in the culture. It was not only saying, we don't really want to hear it, but was saying, you don't have a right to share it. We didn't really know what to make of it. We weren't even sure we were making the right assessment. And we came to no conclusion. But I remember the conversation. It was some time after that, probably two or three years after that, that I came across a story, and it was probably because I'd been thinking about such things that the story caught me. I want to read to you the words of the story written by Stanley Gady. 
S.D. Gady at that time, at the writing of the story, was provost of Gordon College back in the Boston area. So Gady wrote this. We live in strange times. Or the times we live in make strangers out of folks like me. I'm not sure which. That was brought home to me last summer while I was doing research at the University of California, Berkeley. I arrived at Berkeley during the middle of the day via the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, a system that the locals complain about but that seems nearly palatial to a Bostonian. The minute I left the subway and ascended to the street, however, I was overwhelmed not only by an entirely unfamiliar aesthetic, but by two distinct sounds. The first sound was rather tame and came from a man standing only a few feet away. He spoke out familiar words, words of repentance and salvation, words of the Bible, words of an evangelist. The second, much louder voice came from a fellow across the street. His message was directed not at passers-by like me, but at the evangelists. He was in less than full agreement with the evangelist. In fact, he was heaping all manner of abuse upon him. What struck me, however, was that not the fact of his antagonism, but its content. For instead of accusing the evangelist of false teaching, he accused him of false practice. Instead of saying, not true, not true, the chosen mantra of this accuser was unfair. Unfair. What galled him, in other words, wasn't the fact that the evangelist proclaimed good news, but that the, he had the audacity to proclaim any bad news at all. The very bad news that sinners need to repent. That was unprincipled, unfair. It was intolerance, pure and simple, and according to the gentleman across the street, it didn't even deserve a hearing. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you thank God, along with me, that we weren't called to be corner street preacher evangelists. I'm very thankful for that because I don't think that's the best way to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ. But having said that, what captured me in Gady's story were the words, unfair, unfair. You don't have the right to say that. Seems like there's a growing trend in our culture in those directions, particularly in faith-based matters. And so here we are caught between, on the one hand, Jesus saying, go tell them. And on the other hand, people saying, you have no right to tell us that. And then add to that one more piece. Add to that our common discomfort with sharing faith matters. I mean, I hope I'm not the only one here who can relate to the words of a writer named Stephen Bonzi, who writes in an article entitled, A Shy Person's Guide to the Practice of Evangelism. See if you can't also relate with these words. Here's what Bonzi writes. Let's pretend that you are someone who might be willing, in theory, at some point, possibly, to consider maybe doing something that, while not evangelism-type evangelism, still could be in some way construed as a sort of sharing of hope, kind of. <laughs> Am I the only one that can relate to that kind of experience, that kind of feeling? The only one who can relate to sitting down on an airplane and saying, Dear Jesus, please help them to put on noise-canceling headphones right over there. Am I the only one? And then we're caught. Jesus says, go tell them. We have our inner resistance. And then there's outward resistance as well. And we have to decide how to respond. I'd like to suggest to you today that the encounter between Jesus and a certain man told in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, may point us in a very good direction on these matters. So we're going to go to Mark 5 this morning. As the story opens, it is likely still dark. The other story having just ended, 
The disciples and Jesus have arrived at the side of the lake to which they have traveled. They have just come out of a furious storm. They're a bit overwhelmed by what happened, but not compared to how utterly awed they are to discover that this Jesus who is with them in the boat has power over nature. They are stunned by that. So they're still living in that reality. It's still dark, likely just that hour before dawn, the darkest of the night, when they step onto dry land. And it is then that the night is pierced. The darkness is sliced in two like a hot knife through butter by the screams and the shrieks and the wails of of what? They must have been frightened almost beyond words. As a man possessed by spirits races toward them. I want to read the story, Mark chapter 5, but I want to ask you to do me a favor. As I read the story, would you be especially attentive to what it is that jumps out at you in the story? What grabs you? What do you notice? Mark 5, verse 1, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had been often chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off, (laughs) no kidding, and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. So what did you notice? So we read through the narrative. What jumped out at you? What grabbed your attention? I'm going to guess that there's somebody here today who said, you know what I noticed? Do you know what grabbed my attention? What grabbed my attention was that Jesus has gone to the other side to the land of the Gergesenes. He's left his homeland behind, the land of ancient Judaism, the land of monotheism, the land to which he belonged, the people to whom he belonged. He has gone to the other side. He's gone to what is now the modern-day Golan Heights, a territory that was almost as contested then as it has been in the modern time. 
He's gone to the other side. And, and maybe you say, I want to ask him the question, what are you doing over here? Jesus, rabbi, I know you're an itinerant rabbi, but you're a Jewish rabbi. What are you doing over here? You're trying to take your mission to the whole world? I mean, wh what are you doing? What are you doing among these people? They're NOPs, Jesus. You know what NOPs are? Not our people. <laughs> what are you doing over here? So maybe that's what you noticed. If it was, it's a good thing to notice. I noticed it as well. Got me to thinking. But it wasn't the main thing I noticed. Or maybe you say, you know, I didn't notice it right away because it was still dark. I noticed it later. Had it been light when we landed, I would have noticed it immediately that this is a dark place. There are a lot of tombs around here. Death pervades this whole region. I haven't had the privilege of being precisely in that location, but I read that even to this day, you can see the evidence of dozens, possibly hundreds of tombs scattering the entire countryside, the mountainsides, the cliffs, with some tombs as large as 20 feet square and, and, and recessed areas in the tombs where the bodies could be laid. Maybe it was there that the demon-possessed man lived. In fact, I even read one scholar, one scholar who says, if you visit the area today, you will encounter troglodytes, people who still live in the tombs, and that you ought to be careful because they are no more friendly to unsuspecting tourists than was this man to the people who came through there in the ancient world. So maybe you would say that. Maybe you would say, I, I didn't notice it first. It was dark. When the light came up, I thought, whoa, what is this? A graveyard? Maybe that's what you noticed. I noticed it wasn't the main thing, but it was there. Or maybe what you noticed was what happened when you took a full deep breath of air. You know what it's like the morning after a storm when the, when, when the rain falling from the sky has washed the world, washed the atmosphere, washed the earth, and now what you feel, what you sense, what you smell is wet, clean freshness. Maybe you thought, I'll step onto the land, I'll pause, <sighs> take in a deep breath of fresh air, clean, and you did it. And then you said, oh, ooh, what is that smell? It, it, it's an aroma. It's a, it's a putrid, penetrating, unclean smell. Well, if you notice that, you're not alone. I want you to listen to two Bible scholars, Walter Wessel and Mark L. Strauss, as they write about that. Here's what they say. The theme of spiritual impurity or uncleanness runs through the narrative. The man is possessed by unclean, akathartos is the Greek word, unclean spirits. He's living among tombs, unclean by virtue of the corpses. The demons are sent into unclean animals which are destroyed. Through Jesus, the kingdom of God is invading and purifying the defiled realm of Satan. Whew. The stench of uncleanness is in the air. So maybe that's what you notice. Hard to ignore it. I noticed it, but it's not the main thing I noticed. Now, there's another reality that I think many, if not all of us, would say we noticed. I mean, how could you avoid it? 
How could you possibly miss in that narrative, in the scene of what unfolded there that morning, the sight and the sound of 2,000 squealing, shrieking, screaming porkers stampeding off the cliff to their death? How could you miss that? You, you, you hold your nose and cover your ears. It's overwhelming. And you think, have mercy. What just happened? That's these people's livelihood. Just gone into the drink. I'm sure you noticed that. I noticed that, absolutely. But it wasn't the main thing. In fact, Another reality that I guess all of us noticed. In fact, another reality that no doubt made us frightened when we saw it was emerging out of the darkness comes this demon-crazed maniac, torn and bleeding, dragging chains, wild-eyed. That'll get your attention, even in that world. It's a scary reality. In fact, there were people who went around trying to exorcise the demons from such people. The story of some of them is told in Acts 19. Made me think of it when I read through this narrative. The seven sons of Sceva. You may remember him. Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, seven sons. They fashioned themselves. They thought of themselves somewhat as exorcists. We'll go exorcise demons from people. And so they had a saying that they used as they attempted to do this. I don't know what all happened except in one case told in Acts 19. In one case, the seven sons of Sceva find themselves face to face with a demoniac, much like this man. And they say to him, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out of him. You know what the demon said? Demon said, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? And jumped on all seven of them, beat them up so badly that the text says that they ran from the house bleeding and naked. <laughs> so be careful taking on a man like this. So you could not miss that scene. As we read the narrative, he had to dominate. He's coming right at us. Oh, I saw him. I saw him. It scared me, made me have itchy feet to run. But it wasn't the main thing I noticed. What did you notice? What jumped out at you? What grabbed you? I would be really surprised if someone here today didn't say, I'll tell you what grabbed me, Randy. What grabbed me was that man, all right, but not at that moment. A few moments later in the scene, when he is, he is he's sitting there, sane, clothed, in his right mind, that caught my attention. Then I said, whoa, what happened here? Well, if you say that's what caught your attention, you would be far from alone. Because after a bit, you can understand it, the people start filtering back and then running back. They have been reached by those who had witnessed what had happened, going into the Decapolis to tell them the ten cities, you've got to come, you won't believe it, we're poor. And so they came. And there he was, the former demoniac, cleansed, sane. Did you notice what the text said? It said the people came, they saw him there, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Oh, and also the pigs, the narrative adds. They didn't like that either, understandably. But this scared them. And so what do they say? They look at Jesus and they say, out of town, out of town. Get out of town. We don't want you here. They noticed that, which is quite remarkable. Because as I read the narrative, I thought, can you imagine that? 
They said, we would rather deal with a demon-possessed maniac than we would deal with this man with a new life. We would rather deal with our old pigs than with your new mind. So Jesus, get out of town. If you say, that's what I noticed, then you're far from alone. A lot of people noticed that, and it had its consequence. I noticed it, but that's not the main thing I noticed. I want to tell you what the main thing that caught me, captured me. In fact, it almost grabbed me around the shirt and said, listen, pay attention. That's how much it caught me. What I noticed was twofold. First, that this man whose life had been changed, that this man who had a new future, that this man who could think and rest, for whom the turbulent soul had been calmed as surely as the sea had been calmed the night before, that this man wanted to go with Jesus, and Jesus said no. What in the world? I mean, Jesus, you've been walking across the countryside, just across this Sea of Galilee. You've been walking around saying to one person after another, follow me, follow me, follow me. You've been inviting people to follow you. You've been creating disciples, people who go everywhere with you, who watch what you say, watch what you do, listen to what you say, observe how you act, and whose lives have been fashioned then after yours. And you're telling them, there's so many who want to come, you're saying, count the cost carefully. You'd better be ready to take up your cross daily and follow me before you come. You've taken it that seriously. And then here is this transformed man who says, I want to go with you. Do you know how the New Revised Standard Version renders the Greek there? Jesus refused. No, absolutely not. That gets my attention because Jesus is behaving here in a way that is out of character for him, and I want to know why. But it's not just that. It's secondly what he adds. After having said no, Jesus, I want to go with you. No, you can't, but, but, here's what I want you to do. They've kicked me out of this country. They're throwing me out. I got to go. This is a dark area filled with the darkness of death and demons and a lack of a knowledge of the true God. This is an area that doesn't want to hear what I have to say, doesn't want to hear the gospel, doesn't want to hear the good news of the kingdom, wants nothing to do with any of it. And I got to go. I need a candle in the night, a candle that can start to light up the night. You can be that if you will just go tell them what I did for you. Just go tell your story. Go back to your home. Go back to your family. Go back to your friends and just say, look at me. There's what I was. Here's what I am. And the difference is Jesus of Nazareth. Just go tell them. Be a witness. Do you know that that statement that Jesus made echoes across the centuries, across the millennia? From a culture as alien to ours as we could imagine, from a time as distant to ours as we can think of a world away. And yet it's as though Jesus steps right into our current cultural milieu and gives us how to be a witness. Just tell them 
what I did for you and how I have had mercy on you. It can be very simple. It can be a doctor at the bedside of a frightened patient who says, you know, at a time of true fear in my own life, I prayed and I experienced peace. It can be a friend to a friend at the gymnasium while they're working out. I know what it is to be so hurried and so harried. Life is turbulent. Feel like your marriage is falling apart. I know what it is. But you know, I have discovered that early morning moments with Jesus do something to me. It can be a teacher to a student. I can so well remember when it seemed like I had no future, nothing there. And then I opened my life to Jesus, and the future opened up. It can be a parent to a wayward child. You just don't understand, Mom. You don't get it, Dad, do you? You don't know how messed up I am. Son, daughter, I can tell you that in my own life as a young person, there was a turbulence, an anger, a rebellion that you've never seen. And then Jesus. Jesus says, just go tell your story. Where has God had mercy on you? I think of these words drawn from the book Ministry of Healing, Ellen White. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace is made known through the holy men of old. That's true. Scripture is vital. But notice what comes next. But that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. Every individual has a life distinct from all others and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him marked with our own individuality. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace when supported by a Christ-like life have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. In other words, tell your story. If you are here this morning, you are here because there's somewhere in your life that Jesus has had mercy on you. There's somewhere in your life where he has poured his grace upon you. I would not be standing in this place without his grace, without the mercy that he extends. You would not be worshiping in this church did not those gentle wooings of the Spirit of God draw you into his presence and assure you no matter what your sin his grace is greater no matter what demons you fight his power is greater there's a place that he's poured his mercy his grace into your life and so in the midst of a culture that is dark and that is demon filled and that is uncertain about the future he simply says to you go tell them what I did for you how I reached into your heart and gave you newness and hope and a future. Just go tell them your story. That's a witness. That's what Jesus calls on us to do. How do you argue with that? If it's told winsomely, with humility, it has a compelling power to it. I love the line from William Barclay, the New Testament scholar, the late William Barclay. I've changed just one word in it, but I love the line, the sentiment that Barclay offers when he says, a witness is someone who makes it easier to believe in God. 
A witness is someone who makes it easier to believe in God. When you are beaten down, overwhelmed, overcome by the forces of darkness, and suddenly somebody stands before you that says, I was where you are. Now I'm where he placed me. Somehow it becomes easier to believe in God. So we're caught in that space. Jesus saying, tell the world. And the world saying, we don't want to hear it. So Jesus changes a life and then just says, go tell your story. That's a witness. And only two things are needed. One, an encounter with Jesus. And two, a willingness to share it. That is a witness. Gracious God, we ask for only two things. We ask for an experience, a life-changing experience with Jesus. And we ask for the courage to tell it. In his name, amen.
again, warm greetings to all of you, dear friends. And just another heads up, I hear about all of you from friends and family members who love you very much. And this is just a reminder, if any of you have family members you'd like to have greeted, just give us a phone call or an email or text message, whatever it takes to let us know. And remember, we like to show pictures too. On the top of my list is Stephen Sladden, New York City. Hello, dear Stephen. Your niece is very, very happy to let us know about your birthday, and I am too. Congratulations, Stephen Sladden and Robert Mitchell. Bless your heart. Glad to have you a part of the family here in Loma Linda. And I was so delighted to get to be with you and your bride last Sabbath. God bless you. Sean Channer, Silver Spring, Maryland. And somebody loves you very much too. And that's the reason I get to say, happy birthday, Sean. Otis Edwards, up in Vancouver, Washington. Yes, we have some history, don't we, Otis? And now I get to find out it's your 90th birthday and I'm giving you a special warm greeting. Hello, Joe Gutman. I met you for the first time a year ago, and now I get to meet you again on another birthday there with Granddad Morris. Congratulations. Dina Parks. Do we have history way back in the Washington Conference and at the Oregon Conference, and now I think you're marking your 91st birthday, and I wish you the very best as I get to also see you there with daughter Betty. Hello, Leonore Flores, Apopka, Florida, and dear friends, let me know, lady, that you are marking your 107th birthday. 107, folks. Warmest congratulations and blessings. Hello, Bev Crick. Glad to see you from Sabbath to Sabbath. And that picture that helps us mark your birthday, Bev. Congratulations. Gwen and I own Richardson, College Place, Washington now. But we had the blessing and the privilege of working together in the Oregon Conference years ago. And now you two are marking your 60th wedding anniversary. Warmest congratulations. All the blessings. Beverly Olson, right nearby here in the villa. Glad to be reminded of your birthday too, Bev, and I wish you the very best. Gabriella Gimble. What can I say, Gabriella? You have been such a blessing in so many lives lately. Wonderful lady, wonderful hostess you are. And I get to say now, Gabriella, happy birthday. Hello, Courtney Jepsum. Yes, we have some history too, I know. And I have such warm memories of some of those earlier days. And now to get to see you, yes, that's Courtney, but look at her with darling Ella. Congratulations, Courtney. Hello, Maggie Bobst, right here at the villa. Glad to know you're close by and having another birthday. I wish you the very best, Maggie. Marta Salcedo. Always glad to be in touch with you. Thank you for the heads up lately and some of the information you've called us with. But the main heads up is your birthday, Marta. And there you are with your beautiful darling daughters. Don McClure, Someone Cares Ministry. That's why we get to know you because of the important work you've been doing. But I found out from Yvonne that you're not doing as well on your birthday. So besides greetings, please know, Don, our prayers are going your way as well. Jesse and Melvin Orser. So glad to be able to be close to you folks lately. And so glad to know you're marking your 74th wedding anniversary. God bless you too, and we'll stay close. Hello, Regsdale family. Yes, the month of June is Regsdale family birthdays, and Don and Dorothea are the start of all of this, and then there's Ron and his family over in Columbus, Ohio. And by the way, I hope you made it well through the tornadoes. And there's Peter Motz at La Sierra, 
Antiana Porter, another part of the family over in Phoenix, Arizona. And hello, Brad Nelson. So glad to be in touch with you these days and hear you in the sanctuary brass as you travel doing missionary work. I just pray God's blessing and happy birthday, Brad. Hi, Laura Nelson, a regular part of our congregation here, always in the choir and we're so grateful. And I'm here to say happy birthday, Laura, and hello, Bobby McGee. Yes, we get on the phone pretty often and I appreciate your ministry so much and your family as well. And I wish you the very best for your birthday, Bobby. Hello, Claude and Lois Turner up Singleton, California. It's actually Shingle Town, California. And the word I have is you are celebrating another anniversary and I'm here to congratulate you. Hello, Lynn Sleeth right here in Loma Linda. Appreciate your friendship, appreciate your leadership, and congratulations on another birthday. All the very best to all of us, okay? See you next time.